Uh, so team, this week we're going to be talking about chapter six. Uh, I'm not using the book down that uh, John had provided us on GitHub. Uh, instead, I, I went directly to uh, Mr. Hadley Wickham's uh, r for ds website um, and went to that particular chapter uh, to discuss this. It is a very brief chapter. Uh, there isn't a lot uh, of material that it's presenting as far as the, the text is concerned. However, it does give us some uh, pathways into additional resources, links uh, for us to follow with. At the close of last week's session, uh, John had made a comment that uh, he was going to be traveling today, so he's not attending. Uh, I'm going to do my best to both moderate and also uh, uh, compile the video at the end of this particular uh, session. So uh, I'm going to try and do my best to follow the timeline. And, and once we reach that one o'clock uh, point central time, uh, that one hour uh, time frame, I'm going to try to uh, uh, close everything down and, and, and get the video posted as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, so chapter six, everyone is talking about scripts. Um, Becky had made a comment about um, kind of the vocabulary term of what a script is. Um, scripts are language or, or a language specific uh, point, human readable point that uh, gets compiled into some level of computer language uh, that runs your program. Um, we talk about Visual Basic scripts, uh, R scripts, Python scripts, Ruby. Uh, there's any number. C++ is probably something that, that people have worked on in the past. At any rate, a script is a uh, text file that a higher order human being is giving instructions to the computer. So when you run your script, it's going to have instructions to do some level of, of task. In the last couple of presentations we've had in this cohort, um, members have shown exactly how they have modeled their scripts, ran the code, et cetera. So that's what we're going to discuss today. Um, oh, I have a quick question. Yes, um, go ahead. So how is a script different from a program that you write? Well, not really much. So okay. I, I delineate the difference between a script and a program as being the script is the higher order language if it's object oriented programming or, or, or just a linear script. Uh, when you compile it and it creates an executable, that now becomes the program. Does that make sense? So uh, the script is, <laughs> is like, well, think of, think of scripting as just very quick, simple, easy things that you tell your computer to do. So in the context of our, our studio uh, uh, conversation, we would script the uh, I don't know, let's say uh, use some kind of ingestion CSV file, uh, which creates our data frame. Then we add some additional munging to it, going through uh, cleaning out the data or, or, or being very specific for it. Um, in the R Studio framework or the R language framework, um, it doesn't compile into a actual program itself. Um, in C++, Java, that's where you start to get your, your uh, scripting or the uh, uh, executable program programming uh, level. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, and, and another way to think of this, and I know I don't mean to, to take too much time explaining, but uh, in the realm of a Linux computer or a, uh, I want to make sure that's a big difference between Linux and, and Windows. Um, in the Linux world, a sh file or a shell script, um, you can tell the, the, the Linux environment to do some action. Okay, um, in the Windows uh, side of that same thought process, you would have like batch files. That would be just a really simple call to a, a library or to a to an executable. When you're writing a C plus plus or a or a Java program and you're interacting with it, that's why I I, I make a big difference between scripting being simple and and programming uh, being a larger uh, uh, adventure into doing other things with with your program or with your with your computer. Does that help, Becky? Awesome. Okay. Um, so what we discussed or the presentation I gave over Chapter Four, uh, we were talking about the four uh, boxes or or uh, containers that our studio provides us. We have the editor, the console, the output, and then up at the top is the environmental area. 
So what we're going to focus on in this particular uh, case or this chapter is going to be on the editor itself. That's where you're going to write your script. Uh, the console is where you would just put in some commands. Uh, we witnessed a, a couple of weeks ago uh, where we were using the question mark and then running some kind of a, a command that would open up a help menu. Uh, and then the output side would be your uh, presentation or, or the, the viewer itself. Okay. All right. So running code, one of the, the quickest and simplest ways that you can run a particular script is just use the command enter key. So your cursor, as you're running down that uh, point on your console uh, or your scripting uh, uh, window, you can hit control enter and it'll run that line of code. The other option that you could have would be control uh, S, control shift S, and that would be running the entire program as a whole or the entire script as a whole, not just a single line of function, but actually the entire block of code. And then at the very bottom of this, and I'm gonna show everybody uh, this activity here in a second. Let me get out of this uh, uh, presentation and then I'll, I'll actually open up um, R itself. The last part of this particular section talks about the R Studio diagnostics. We get these squiggly lines or these um, uh, red X's when we have entered code that doesn't get recognized by the environment we're, we're writing in. And our studio provides us some level of uh, recommendation. Uh, you may have made a mistake in your in your uh, syntax, and so our studio is reminding you, hey, you may have missed a uh, equal sign, uh, maybe a double equal sign, a, uh, a an assignment variable, uh, some kind of a pipe, possibly. All right. At the very end, we've got two options here. Uh, the exercises, uh, question number one, had us going to our studio uh, tips uh, a Twitter account and looking through and, and finding something that we want to present. The second would be uh, an addition link that would take us into more exhaustive diagnostic features within our studio. So uh, I'm going to reverse these. I'm going to do the diagnostic features first uh, before I, I, I show you my favorite uh, point of the RStudio Tips Twitter account. So to do that, I am opening up the web page uh, diagnostics, code diagnostics within our studio. Now, there's a huge quantity of features within our studio that you can turn on and turn off. And, and by default, uh, you're going to be presented with probably the easiest and simplest way of managing our studio. But if there's an additional feature that you want to add in, uh, making the environment more unique to you uh, as, a, as an individual, uh, you can turn on or turn off these features. Okay? So the, the options that we have uh, when presenting is uh, enabling diagnostics with function calls, uh, checking arguments uh, within that function call itself, uh, you'll see these windows popping up and I'll show you this in real time here in just a second. Uh, we can have warnings uh, if a variable is used and has no definition in the scope. We haven't defined it yet. We haven't told our studio this is a uh, 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 assignment variable that we want to uh, uh, pass uh, information to. We also have some additional white space variables. Uh, this will come um, uh, this will come up uh, quite often if we extend the R language into other programming services. Uh, so we can add additional features to, to remind us, hey, you might want to add some white space here, make the code a little bit read, uh, uh, read easier. In the nature of viewing the diagnostics, uh, there's going to be some, I'll, I'll call them widgets. I don't know if that's the right term to use. Uh, you have your um, uh, cautionary, uh, which would be your triangle with the exclamation point. Uh, exclamation point. Uh, the code may run, but it's not technically correct. Uh, we may find this in, in some of our language. Um, I personally am not the best at scripting, so I always get the red X because I'm getting uh, bad code and I have to go in and, and research exactly why it is that that function isn't operating properly. Okay. There are some project level diagnostics that you can turn on. In this case, uh, I'll show you this. Uh, there's a little wand. Uh, it's, it's the magic wand. Uh, this will give us some additional features within the scripting window itself. Uh, we can add um, like step through process if we're debugging a particular code as we're ingesting data, uh, cleaning it, uh, processing it, et cetera. Okay. 
And then finally, the magic comments. Um, I've never used the magic comments before. Uh, our Studio Diagnostics engine can be controlled on a per file basis. Um, in this case, the following settings are currently supported. We have diagnostics off and then diagnostics style. Uh, you can either add, uh, I, I look at this as kind of almost like some uh, additional flavoring that you as a person may add to your environment. Maybe you've got a saved uh, uh, favorite that you want to incorporate into your existing uh, environment that you're working on. Maybe it's a work computer and a personal computer, but you want both uh, uh, environments to operate in a similar manner. Okay. All right. So let's switch over. Does anybody have any questions about that statement at all? Chapter six is fairly short, so I hope I'm not going too fast for anybody. Or does anybody want to add additional content to this? All right. Let me move on. So I'm going to switch gears here. And let's open up our studio for a second. Now, one of the, the paths that, uh, or the assignments within chapter six, the exercises in chapter six, it had us go to the uh, R Studio Tips Twitter feed and look through some content of, of media that we want to present to others, right? Something that's, that's very unique that you found uh, interesting and you wanted to share with the group. In this case, uh, what I wanted to share with everybody was the markdown feature. Um, I think I went too fast into it. Forgive me. Let me go back to my next slide here. Uh, so the link that you have in your textbook uh, will take us to this Twitter feed, uh, our studio tips. And as I scrolled through all of these, the first thing that jumped out to me was a post uh, from this uh, Lar Lars, and I'm going to mispronounce the last name, so uh, I'll just leave it at Lars. But uh, they were talking about uh, features within the 1.4 uh, environment of, of our studio. Uh, if you haven't updated your uh, environment, that's OK. Um, this feature gets turned on in 1.4, uh, which gives complement to the R Markdown syntax. Now, R Markdown is uh, what we use in Bookdown, what we use in a lot of our presentation slides, uh, the uh, document that I'm showing you here. Uh, Mr. Hadley Wickham had wrote, uh, this was done in the book down format. So each one of these chapters is a R markdown file, not only the code tips, but also the syntax or the heading levels, et cetera. Okay. So I didn't realize, or I wasn't aware that with this particular link, you can turn on additional IDE features, uh, uh, integrated development environment features dedicated to just R markdown. And I found this really awesome. Uh, I do a lot of my markdown authoring in other frameworks. Uh, Atom is one of them. It's a derivative of the GitHub environment. Uh, it's a text editor similar to Sublime. Uh, there's another feature uh, that I use often called Jupyter Notebooks. That's a very Pythonic way of, of writing uh, markdown files. Okay. Ultimately, markdown as a service is a simpler way for a person to author text that gets compiled into HTML output. Okay, so it's a it's a protocol translation. But let me show you how this feature works, and we'll evoke some of our chapter six topics in this this context. So to turn on or turn off this feature, you've got a tiny little uh, call it a, a quill or a uh, what's the what's the stylus the the old ink uh, writing uh, pen. Uh, you can turn that feature on or off. So right now I just shut the feature off. Um, if you have downloaded our GitHub page, uh, the r for ds uh, book club uh, GitHub account, uh, the, the, the repository, you'll see a lot of RMD files. Well, I just created one briefly for us to, to uh, mess around with today. But this, uh, this additional feature that I'm showing you uh, is, is only in the desktop IDE environment of our studio. And I'll show you the difference here in a second why uh, I couldn't get this application to, to run earlier. Okay, so I'm going to turn on this quill. You'll notice that the text itself doesn't look uh, very codified anymore. Um, we call this rendering. Okay, so you're taking a, a lower language, this markdown format, and then creating it into a more presentable media. But within the IDE of this uh, service, you can now 
uh, add these additional features uh, like you would in a what you see is what you get type Word document, uh, Google Sheets, or, or sorry, Google Docs. Um, I can't remember what the document format is on Mac, but okay. So go back to the top here. You'll notice that it's the exact same text, but it looks a little bit different. What this is is now rendered. So if I were to select this and say, I don't know, let's change this R markdown to, to R markdown with R, okay. What you see happening in real time is that the text is now showing in my table of contents. These are heading levels. Okay. If I wanted to introduce a code block, before uh, you just had your three tick marks and then inside that tick mark would be your, your text. Now I'm showing you an actual code block like you would witness on a forum post or, or any kind of a, a web page where it's, it's giving you instruction on how to do this. Those are called code blocks. If I wanted to actually run this code, okay, because it's a interactive environment, I can now hit the run button, all right, and I'm going to get a summary of the car's uh, data frame. Okay. If I wanted to introduce the, the plotting, okay, so here's another code chunk. Let me show you real quick. I'm going to shut this off and go back to the code itself, right? We still get that code block. We've got our tick marks here, okay? And I can run the code as well. Okay. So I get a plotted output of that uh, pressure within the car's data frame. But if I do this from a stylus form, now it just looks more presentable. Uh, if you were to use other services beyond our studio to do this same framework, um, this would make you smile because it, uh, it, it's, it's an in interactive environment that now you can render your code in real time. So as you type it, uh, it's going to output that HTML uh, form and now it makes documentation a lot simpler. Uh, let's put down here a bit. So what I did is I created this additional block. I love R Markdown. Uh, I wasn't aware you could do this instead of, uh, of instead I had a, uh, been using a Jupyter notebook instead. Uh, this is more of a Python oriented form of authoring. Now I can bring that same flavor back into R as well. Now we can make a document using R Studio and the visual coding here. So I've got a, the, this is an example from a web page, but um, it's taking that same cars data frame and then using ggplot to output uh, some text or render a table, okay, visualize, show you what that does as it processes, All right? And now here I can see the efficiency uh, of that particular displacement, engine displacement. Uh, I believe this was an exercise in one of our chapters. Um, so I'm not being special here by writing my own code. I'm copying from other uh, areas to, to showcase what we're doing here. Okay. My favorite part of this R Markdown format would be the use of tables. So let's create another table. Uh, if you've ever worked with R Markdown, or excuse me, just Markdown syntax period uh, using tables, they can be a little problematic. Uh, it is a syntactical way of presenting uh, media uh, in, a, in a tabular form, uh, but they're not they don't render very well. And so by using this format, what you do is you create the backslash or maybe that's a forward slash uh, and you get your, your drop down options here. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna create another table, right? Now I get this additional window. Previously, this wouldn't have been an option. It's only after you turn on this stylus form of, of our markdown. I'm going to create a, a new table and we're going to call this uh, R4DS cohort. Okay, so that's just the caption that'll show up at the bottom of this table. I go ahead and say enter and now I create another table. We can see that our caption is below the table. If I wanted to enter some media here, uh, let's say uh, and YN. And Susie, there you go. Uh, yep, okay. And then maybe I've got some additional content that I want to add about uh, a particular user. Um, so 
I guess my point of this R markdown, R tips assignment, um, I wasn't aware that you could do this in our studio. And so I'm kind of excited and I want to share this with others. Um, it complements one of the assignments within this chapter six. So now let's extend this into even more. Does anybody have any questions or curiosity about our markdown uh, or just markdown in period? No. If you want to know more about the markdown syntax uh, in authoring, um, there is a, a website. Uh, I don't remember the person's name, the developer's name, but uh, I think it's called Daring Fireballs, if I'm not mistaken. One second, I'll just search it real quick. I think it's a markdown. Yes. So this is the original, uh, John Gruber is the original developer of the Markdown syntax. Uh, you will find that there's a whole wealth of different formats of Markdown. Uh, so keep that in mind when you are uh, generating or outputting content. Uh, you may use a particular style of Markdown and then realize that the environment you're working in, it won't re uh, render properly. Uh, that's because the underlying syntax doesn't match. Uh, so this is the, I guess, core beginning of, of Mr. Gruber's uh, uh, environment. Um, GitHub, GitLab, Microsoft, uh, other Pythonic ways of doing this, they, they use different syntactical uh, points. So anyway, I'm, I'm very excited about tech writing. And so Markdown is one of my favorite uh, simple ways of generating content by being able to do this in our studio. Um, I'm very, very happy and excited to see this. Okay. And for those that are helping uh, moderate, uh, I don't have my chat window open. Uh, I, I apologize. Is there anybody that has posted anything about chatting uh, or any questions at all that I may have missed? Um, Brian, I just, um... Yeah. Like to make a comment. Did you look at um, yeah, go ahead. when you do a file new, you can also do a R notebook? Would that be more? That's like correct. Particular? Well, actually, yes. Uh, that's a good comment, Eileen. Thank you for asking that. Um, let me show that real quick. Yeah. What Eileen's showing us is if you go to a new file, uh, there is a notebook option. I think maybe you're right, Eileen. That may be more what I'm talking about with that uh, Jupyter notebook comment. Uh, the R notebook may be the same contact. Also in chapter uh, 20, uh, sorry, also in chapter no, 23, good. they talk about the YML, YAML, um, uh, headers. YAML, yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so do and you... I thought, so that, I thought that was kind of useful as well, because you can do, do different formats. Very, very, very good comment, Eileen. That's an excellent comment. So uh, YAML stands for not, uh, yet another markup language. Uh, it's a, a syntactical form. Uh, the YAML is often used within containerized uh, frameworks, Ansible workflows, et cetera. Uh, what you're doing is commanding uh, textual media in this particular tabulated form of, of file uh, to give instructions to other tools or services within your environment, within your computer. And Eileen, if you're, are you more familiar with that format in, in the notebook? Is that this text at the very top of our screen? I think that's, uh, yeah, that's what I'm referring to. Cause I, I was playing around with, um, there's different yeah. outputs like the shiny output versus the HTML document. Yeah. And interactive, yeah. you know what I mean? Versus going to an R, you know, like just going, to, using an R app, mm -hmm. you know? For shiny, I guess I'm thinking about shiny, but no, um. no, you're okay. Uh, <laughs> Eileen and I are in the in the uh, uh, mastering shiny cohort as well, so she's bringing yeah, it up. A, just, a topic. I haven't really explored it as much as I should should be, but I was just curious. Okay. You've no, this is it. good. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, I, I'm more familiar with uh, YAML files or or just instruction like that, dealing in Dockerized, containerized form of of management. Uh, I've never used it within the context of a, a shiny app or, or within our studio yet, but I'm 99.9% I'm .9 sure that this top uh, dashed area is the YAML call to creating that 
uh, service. And it's actually this output line. If we change that to be a HTML file, or if we change that to be a Word document, if we change that to be some other output, um, there's a service underneath all of this team uh, called Pandoc. Pandoc is your compiler. So you're taking it from one language, passing it through this, this uh, uh, compilation programming form, and then it outputs into another uh, uh, service. So I call that Pandoc protocol translator. That may be the wrong term to use, but uh, it's, a, it's a syntactic uh, way of, of ingesting in one form of language and then outputting into another form. So it's kind of an interpreter. Yeah, I think R has uh, knit R. Knitter? Uh, knitters is one of them, correct? Yes. Um, yeah, if we drop down and, and look at HTML, PDF, or Word, those are three ways that you can output. Um, knitter is the simple way of compiling code. Um, there are other features uh, that you can call on other environments that you can call on to pass. Uh, that notebook and the book down language uh, provides us other services and tools to, to compile with. Good comment. Oh, thank you, Ryan. You bet. You bet. So I'm going to switch gears to another avenue uh, that I wanted to share. And this has to do with a curiosity that I've been dealing with as of lately. Um, I've never applied for a Twitter API uh, developer account. Uh, so what I'm going to show you next is just me interacting with my own uh, Twitter feed. So what I did briefly, I, I did show you that there is a error. I hope everyone can see that. Um, I'm creating a variable X and Y, uh, and then passing the value of 10 uh, to that. I'm getting an error because it's saying that's not right. If I were to change that and either get rid of the Y or get rid of the X, uh, then it would be acceptable because I'm having this white space in between X and Y. Uh, it doesn't recognize what I'm doing here. So let's put a underscore. If I put an underscore, it should get rid of the error. Right? So that's a that's a white space error, uh, an empty value. I can't assign the I can't assign the very uh, value ten to this because R doesn't recognize it. Hey Ryan. Yeah, go ahead, Lucas. Um, I think if you you surround those with back tips, it, it should work. Uh, like this. Yep. Or or quotation marks just like oh that. interesting yeah ah, and i bet you that's probably a namespace variable fault then right yeah uh, so what it is is that the the characters that are not allowed in r you can navigate away from those by surrounding them with back ticks or with interesting quotation marks yeah well so lucas you're bringing up a really good point um if if you're into software development or programming development coding computer science etc there's always this hidden agenda that tells you don't add spaces to file names right if you're going to create another file don't add spaces to it uh, the reason for that is because in the uh, i guess the, the environment that you're working in this this operating system that you're working in it may be recognized it may not be recognized so what lucas just did by adding those tick marks around it is now allowing the uh, use of white space because now I'm inside that namespace variable. Um, this is a really good comment, Lucas. Thank you for, for noticing that. I wasn't aware that you could do the, the tick marks with that too. Uh, does I think I'm using the back tick, but does it work with quotation mark too? Uh, Isn't your assignment that. arrow the wrong way? Uh, you're right. Forgive me. That's a good point. <laughs> Thank you, Eileen, for noticing that. Uh, I typed that really quick right before the the. Uh... I can't take credit for that, but I did think it also. <laughs> oh, why, 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 why? And I'm sorry. Uh, that was your your statement. Um, yes, you're right. I I used the wrong uh, variable to to excuse me. I used the wrong syntax to pass that. So, uh, but Lucas, I think this works as well with quotation marks, right? Yeah, it works uh, both ways with the quotation marks, the double, and the uh, and the back ticks as well. Excellent. excellent. Um, I wasn't where you could do that. Yeah, it's a it's a bad habit, but you can do it if you want to. Good point. Good point. Well, the excitement that I wanted to share with the group 
with this particular script. And if, if you've never done this before uh, or, or you have, and you wanna expand on the topic, please uh, feel welcome to uh, jump in with this presentation as well. Uh, first thing that uh, I noticed in the text was it stated, don't, uh, if you're going to share a script file with another person, uh, don't automatically uh, add the install packages uh, call uh, the statement I smiled at uh, mentioned uh, that's kind of almost like you uh, changing another user's computer. Uh, that's usually a, a taboo. You don't want to do that. Um, so in this case, I deleted that install packages text. I've already downloaded the the uh, file or the libraries that I needed to run this code. Okay, but we are going to call on them. So again, if we want to do a control enter, actually, you know what? Let's go to the very top and go ahead and run the uh, comment that Lucas had made about the uh, tick marks. Uh, so now I've got a, a value called XY and it has the uh, value of 10 assigned to it. Okay. So here I'm using control enter to run each line of code. My cursor is on line four at the moment. When I hit control enter, notice at the bottom, you will see the uh, the uh, console output of that command. So control enter, you'll notice that I just ran or, or, or incorporated that rtweet package uh, to my uh, RStudio environment. And I did that same thing with dplyr. Now I made a note to myself that this next code is going to, or this next line, this uh, uh, line number nine, it's gonna populate a data frame uh, using a hashtag to search. So whatever value I want to put in there, and then it's going to report back the number of tweets uh, for that particular hashtag. Now I am limiting that value N to being 200 lines, or sorry, 200 uh, uh, entries. Uh, the RTweet API allows you to download 18,000 uh, 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 tweets if you want to expand or increase your value, increase the amount of content you're, you're downloading or searching. Uh, that 18,000 limit resets every 15 minutes. Uh, so it's kind of almost like preventing the Twitter uh, uh, database from being spammed by others. Okay. So we're going to limit it, limit it to 200. Um, I've ran the code a couple of times, so I am increasing the amount of hits I can make to my account. All right. So let's change this real quick. And I'm going to put this as RStudio. All right. And when I run this, particular line, you'll notice that I'm downloading and I have 95 observations of 90 variables apiece. The data frame of Twitter or the API of Twitter will create this 90 variable data frame. Within that, you can start to do some searching. If you're following any of the, uh, uh, what's the word? Sediment analysis, uh, uh, phrasing, wording. Um, if you want to create a word cloud, if you're looking at how often the tweets are, there's some geospatial data uh, contained within the twi uh, tweets as well. Okay. So there's other things that we can do with that data frame that we just created. Okay. Just to prove that I did enter, I tried to make an error here, but it didn't. It didn't like what I was doing. Uh, that's going to give me an error. Uh, but I'm not getting any diagnostic because of it. I'm not getting any debugging because of it. I do get an error that says it couldn't find the function uh, summary. I ended up just changing the Y to an I to force it to, to uh, error out. If I run that same second line again, now I can see that I've got some content here giving me some idea of what material is contained within this data frame. The, uh, the the text. Okay. I haven't found the quick, simple way of just viewing it, uh, opening up the viewer and looking at it from like a table form. Um, I always go and open it this way. That's probably a, there's an easier way of doing it. I just don't know what it is. So if anybody would like to share that comment, you're welcome to. Can you type in uppercase view and then the is name that of it? the frame. Yeah, ah. if you type in, go back to your okay. thing. There we go. Up you just said yeah. like, like that? Yep, and then pass in the data frame. It parentheses, then the name of your data frame. That is much simpler. Thank you. 
Um, and by the way, the uh, the uppercase view is for for the base R. The the tidy verse R we use just the lowercase v, which is oh interesting. Not very. So there is. Yeah, you can use both ways. Okay, very good, very good. Uh, is there any? Well, I guess would it be more R Studio to stay within? Well, we're our cohort is is related to the tiny verse, uh, a tidy verse. So would it be more prevalent for us to say? Use the lowercase version of it then? No, it doesn't matter really. They both it work. Doesn't. I've used them okay. all the time. Yeah, it's kind of annoying. Very good. Like the uh, the capital view every time though. So I see. The lowercase view is much quicker and faster. I think, in my opinion. Well, I don't. Uh, there's a there's a school of thought when it comes to programming or or using the keyboard shortcuts, etc. That uh, it's not being lazy. It's being efficient. Uh, you're very efficient with your keystrokes. So adding that capital V as Lucas is referring to, um, it's easier to not hit the shift key and just hit lowercase v. Uh, good, good comment, sir. Um, now my screen is in the way and I don't know how to get underneath that. Can I close that out? No. You can, um, you can, so which screen do you want? Uh, well, it's, it's underneath this, you're sharing your screen. I'm trying to figure out oh. how I can get my mouse underneath there. Um, let's close some of these and then it'll, it'll work. And let's run that view again. There we go. No, it, it didn't like that. Oh, I'm not running the actual tidyverse. I'm just running dplyr only. There we go. Okay. So for those members that may not be overly familiar with the R Studio environment. The viewer is, is a way that it renders in a, a tabular form. Uh, so you've got your, your variables across the top of your row and then the values uh, of that variable, uh, sorry, the row itself. Um, so I've downloaded 90, let's say 95 observations. So I've got 95 rows in this particular data frame, okay. And using dplyr or any other tidyverse function, I can start to manipulate or modify some of the text. I didn't take the I didn't take this assignment any further than just being able to connect and download. So. You can also search in the viewer, like if you, you can just you, uh, and you can filter by. Um, I was thinking if each, you can turn it off, must be on Something like that, maybe. Oh, uh, it allows it to sort as well, correct? Doesn't it, Wyan? Yep, you can sort, um, filter, and search. So it's um, a quick way to browse your data before actually doing it in code if you wanted to. Excellent yeah. comment, excellent yeah. comment. Yeah. Um, this is the point where I start to get a little unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not the greatest at actually manipulating content yet. Uh, that's a task. Uh, I can ingest me media, I can search media, but after that, when I start to compile or, or visualize output, uh, that's where my uh, my current learning curve starts to drop off. So, how many oops they said? I did want to add briefly to this subject on this topic. If we go to a different view, and go back to my browser real quick. It is again underneath. There's a there's a menu bar across the top of my screen that I'm unable to remove or, or get rid of. But if I go to my personal studio, uh, our studio web server, uh, I've created a, a environment within my household where I can I can come at our studio from multiple computers. It's not a actual running program on my, my current laptop, it's more global to everything and anything. I can, I can just open an IP address and, and go directly to it. Where this becomes an error is that if I try to run the same code, you'll notice that at the top, I don't have that R markdown stylus anymore. Uh, so I'm still able to interact with the media. I just can't uh, uh, deploy that, uh, package 1.4, RStudio environment 1.4 uh, method of, of adding some 
extra features because this is a web server, not the actual uh, program on my laptop. Okay. The second comment that I will have to this, I, I'm beating my head against the wall with the RStudio uh, web environment, figuring out how to create that same RTweet code. So you have to pass a, uh, an authentication uh, if you're going to deploy this uh, uh, tweet data frame API format. Every time I try to do this on this computer, uh, it will open up another browser as a authorization, uh, but it's local to my computer I'm using, not the actual web server itself. So what ends up happening is this security hiccup that I can't actually get the code to run. It'll give me an error. So um, that's a comment only for those users that may have different uh, uh, environments they work out of. So anyway, I wanted to share that statement as well. Um, excuse me. Um, yes, go ahead. I have a question. How did you open up the, this, um, this page? Your are asking so, you in the browser? Yes, so instead of having my local machine RStudio, the IDE itself, the program RStudio on, on, on this computer, what I did is I created a, a Linux web server on a, sorry, there we go. Uh, I created a, a web server and loaded the RStudio uh, environment onto that web server. So now all I do is I can come from a Windows, Linux, or Mac computer, type in my IP address, and it'll be the same regardless of the computer I'm using uh, because I'm manipulating the server itself. Uh, there was a post that I read about, and sorry, team, if I'm taking anyone down a rabbit hole, uh, I want to answer her question. Um, RStudio desktop versus our studio server. And so in the, the RStudio support forum, uh, this individual, uh, Ian, Ian, uh, Pelvenen, Pelvenen, uh, they, he wrote some topics, uh, blog posts about the difference between a desktop environment versus a server environment. Um, if you were a, at a employer that uh, invests in the RStudio uh, enterprise, the, the uh, enterprise version, you get additional features. And ultimately what you're doing is interacting with this RStudio server. You're just paying somebody to host that environment. So you would have your own web URL uh, to navigate to. So in that case, I'm just using my local environment to do that with. Okay. Rika, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. I did, just didn't know about this. Well, the, um, the whole, yeah, go ahead. The idea of me going this route or the, the team, the whole concept of, of where I'm going with this is I find myself from a employer's standpoint using Windows-based programming um, in my own personal life or, or where I'm going with the data science field is more Linux based or uh, Unix based. So that disruption between the services uh, creates this really weird uh, confusion on what I would operate on in Windows versus what I would operate on in Linux. So I decided to get around that thought process by just creating a, a static web server that I manipulate from there. Uh, and then therefore it would be agnostic to the operating system itself. Um, John had made a comment uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago where I'm using a Mac computer and he goes, that's probably the most closed sourced form of, of operating system you have. And although I agree, yes, um, the, uh, it was a gift from my wife after graduation that uh, uh, she ended up getting a MacBook. But um, I can do this uh, change or this, this environment in different ways. And so being agnostic to your code uh, or to the web server itself now puts all the resources in one place. So you're not having any confusion with multiple uh, entities. Does that I'm help Frederica? Yeah, I'm actually yeah. wondering if you can maybe use um, yeah. the cloud. Uh, 
the R Studio Cloud, that could be another option, but that, that one has limitation on it does, yeah. Storage, I think, right? It's it's storage and the amount of uh, processing uh, that you can do with it. Uh, there, it, I think it's limited by storage. But uh, if you started to do some really crazy regression or or things that take a lot of time uh, and 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 resources, um, they're going to limit you on on doing that. They're going to ask you to pay for the service. Uh, Lucas, another statement in that same mindset would be the shiny server or shiny IO. Yeah. Uh, in that case, it only allows you one web page uh, where I, because I've got this environment, I could have unlimited web pages. Does that make sense? Yeah. By stepping ahead into this more sysadmin level of, of management, uh, now I can, I can still be in that free world or open source world while still maximizing the ability of, of expansion. Yeah, one thing you can do, uh, I know some people have, have done this before, you can you can build a Docker container and uh, put your yes. stuff in there and then just use the container everywhere you go. That could be That's much true. better probably. Yeah, if you're, if you're, so what Lucas is referring to team is, is containerization. Um, and that is the future of serverless computers where you just have a data center that has resources and you script or, or command uh, a, a container that uh, uh, you literally just call on. And so it'll expand into its, its environment, work within it, and then it'll, it'll go away or you save it, you update it similar to what you're doing with GitHub or GitLab. So that's uh, doc, uh, Docker Hub is the, the name of the website. Yeah, that I service. It, yeah, I think it's, it's Docker Hub if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, and and hey. all, they, I think they have their own, I think it's called Rocker or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the, the R Studio. Yeah. Good point. Mm. Sorry, I have that. one more question. Uh, I don't know if you if you are aware about. Uh, uh, if you go back to your R Studio, there yes, is um, in the in one of the the section like where um, here at the um, the bottom right uh, at the bottom left when you see okay. console where the console is uh, there's yes, terminal and then markers and jobs. Uh, yes. I know what terminal is because um, I've used it um, mostly when I render some documents. So mm -hmm. uh, then I don't know what markers and jobs are. I think if, if I you know anything about them. I, I, I'm going to stab in the dark. No, I'm not familiar with these two tabs. I believe jobs are the active running services. If you call on a data frame and you get your little stop symbol where the the, the uh, service is running uh, or the, the application is running, I think if you were to open your jobs tab, it would be the instructions. You would be able to see uh, what, the, what the service is doing in the background. I'm not familiar with what markers are though. And it, I'm only hedging my bet with this comment of diagnostics. I don't, not familiar with what that service is doing. Um, for this week, I will try to do some research and post on Slack uh, for the cohort. Uh, so get a little bit more familiar with these two tabs uh, if, if anybody else is curious about them. Yeah. Does that help, yeah. Frederica? Yes. Um, because um, when you render, like uh, you do a shiny app. Yes, ma'am. This is something um, that we will see maybe later on in the in the other sections, but so. um, uh, maybe it's something related with that. You like have something with uh, uh, collecting things, and then uh, the jobs activate to show you what it's doing. Um, I've seen it once, but I don't recall it at the minute. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just wanted to know. And then what are the others? So I know what Git is and the tab uh, on the top where the environment is. There's environment, yes. history, connection, and Git. Mm -hmm. So just, um, I know that Git is a connection. It's a direct connection with the GitHub page mm -hmm. if you have an account you can open an account and collect like uh, sort of uh, repositories for yourself mm -hmm. when you do a project and then you can connect 
that account with your R Studio. Uh, yes. It's a bit like sort of. Uh, um, uh, no, it's a version saver, actually, yes. of your version job. Control. Version control. Um, and then you have these other tabs. I don't know if you want to. I sure can. Yeah, let's let's uh, let's discover or 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 uh, review what what all of these other tabs imply. So you have your your. I, I, I apologize. This it's underneath my my uh, window here, but. Um, the first tab is going to be your data frames or any sort of variables that you've created. Uh, if you want to search those, we discussed that. The history tab is everything that you've ran in the console. So the, uh, or even in your script, it, it's, it's the history of, of what the program or the environment is doing. So we can go back and look at anything you can see. I I've, I've, was trying right before the, the call started. Uh, I was trying to figure out a way how I could delete my my R Studio token because I wasn't populating any data frames. So I was trying to run some code here. Uh, when I called on the R Tweet and Dplyr libraries, uh, when I was downloading the data frame itself, um, uh, changing the summary and the detail. So this is a, a recording of everything that happens in the console itself. Okay. The connections, this is actually a really cool uh, feature. Uh, a lot of our teams probably won't uh, uh, use this as an application, but if you're connected to a database, in this instance, I've got a, a service running. I don't know if anybody can see that. Uh, I've got a Postgres database running in my, my computer. I've got a connection to that Postgres database. Uh, I don't know if it'll show me, let's try it real quick. No, I don't know how I can get the OBDC, ODBC to open uh, or to show you. But um, in this instance, what I was doing for a, a, a development uh, or a research, uh, I connected to a service that the government has called ONET, and it was the occupational network. So they uh, author in a SQL language, SQL language. I was using Postgres, uh, Postgres SQL to download or connect to that service. So I created my own environment linked to it. And then now I'm, I'm just interacting with it locally. So I'm not making uh, outward calls uh, over the internet to another uh, uh, server, uh, another environment. Um, so that was, Wait. that was what, go ahead. That's, Postgres is a database. It is. Okay, so you're connecting to a database. Because the data it sound like Postgres is your connection. But... No, yeah, you're right. You're right. No, Postgres is the is the database itself. Okay. And the ODBC is the connection. So that's uh, oh, yeah, ODBC. It's uh, uh, I can explain. I guess the the ODBC is the the package that allows you to connect to different databases. There so we go. You you use ODBC or DBI. It, it, provides the um, metadata information that you need in order to connect to different databases. So if, yes. you, if you click on the connect, um, that little right there. there um, so if you have a lot of connections, like you can even connect to like multiple different databases at one time. Yeah. And you should have um, a way to navigate through them. Like in the normal, like if you're doing SQL where you have the list of mm -hmm. the schemas and, and the tables, you, can, you yeah. can get to see all of them here by point and clicking. For example, I think if yes. you click on public there, uh, right there, uh, the little play button, yeah, there you go. And then if you click on one of the tables, it should populate the table on your view. Uh, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, right there. There we go. Excellent, thank you. There you go. Yes. So what Lucas is doing, this is that ONET database I was referring to. I've got a table called abilities. And within that table abilities, there's a thousand entries and 12 columns total. Um, this is definitely more advanced than the cohort is currently working on in the in the book. And this is okay to communicate about, uh, but just know that your ingestion of media, if it's a uh, CSV file, a JSON file, a database, right? If you're, if you're doing some uh, HTML ingestion, right? Uh, uh, recording from the web, all of these different ingestion methods uh, are just stored media. 
right? How am I, how am I uh, manipulating that media? Uh, as Lucas had mentioned, the ODBC is the connection made or the language, the common language from your RStudio environment to that database SQL language. And then now once the connection is made, now I can access it from within RStudio. Good comment, Lucas. No problem. And the question earlier about markers, it's basically, it's, a, oh. it's, ba it's used for diagnosis. Like sometimes, I don't know if you have ever seen it in your R script sometimes in the margin, but if you go to like, do you have an R script open? I do, yes. This is just okay, our example so, from earlier. So sometimes you, you have the numbers, you have the row mm -hmm. numbers. And to the right of that, sometimes you see um, like a, a sign, like a exclamation in the triangle. Oh, is that similar to what we had the yeah. at the very like the beginning, then, right? Sometimes if okay. you do that, and if you do show diagnosis, um, it will show like a summary of like various errors um, instead of showing uh, just, just the the symbol in the gutter or whatever I, we want to call this. It yeah, would show okay. a summary of it here in the market. That's a, that's a feature we have to turn on though, right? Um, and that yeah, was the, the diagnostic web page that I was showing. Yeah. That's where okay. the, the when you run the diagnosis and it shows like the various errors or warnings, it that's where the errors and warnings would appear in the marker panel. Okay, okay. Uh, so if you Frederica, don't do diagnosis, then you probably won't see this. You won't use this panel. Uh, I, I've I've never actually populated this window. Uh, Brian, uh, Frederico is asking about the, the use of that tab. Um, in the web page I showed at the very beginning, going through the content, uh, I went to the diagnostic additional features. If I opened up the tools option, I need to figure out how to get rid of this. Well, okay, let's just get my, sorry. There we go. Uh, tools, and then I go to global options, code, and then I go to diagnostics. This is what the web page was telling us uh, are extending into additional features. So it appears by default or, or the environment I'm operating in, uh, I don't have that option turned on. Um, I don't know which one it would be in this like, selection. Click on warn if variable if variable is used, but no definition or yeah, click on those. And okay. then if you actually put those types of errors in your code where you um, create a variable, but don't use it or define a variable, but don't use it. Um, and yeah. then you'll see, see how you have that now that um, yeah, triangle with the exclamation point, it's telling you that that's a warning in your code. Mm -hmm. And okay. if you run the diagnosis, it will then summarize it in the markers panel. Uh, so that was our, that's this option up here, correct? Yeah. Show diagnostic. Yeah. There we go. That's how Frederica. the markers panel is used. Perfect. Frederica, does that answer your question that you had asked for? Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. I appreciate it. I've never populated that before. I've never witnessed it populate before. That does make sense now. And now you can options. see some of these um, errors or warnings that are within that one file. Yeah, yeah, excellent. I wasn't, uh, I, this, is, this is awesome. I learn more features about our studio every day. Very cool. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty helpful. I, I rarely use it because I prefer uh, running the debugger from from the from the console. Um, okay, but you can you can actually control um, on the on the appearance there on the pen layout. Which how do you, how do you run the debugger from the console? Yeah, how do you do that, Lucas? Yeah, I think there's a there's a function. Uh, let's see if I remember the function name. Where you can you can you can uh, call the debugger function. Uh, I think it's called debug. 
and then there you go. yeah and then you 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 run it on a specific line of code to right code you need to put the, the function that you want to check inside yes yes so, so if i would to say like search tweets as a as a function then right so debug uh and then inside would be search tweets that operate then why not so there's it, it replied back with no warning message and i guess pending rows pending rows because be, yeah you don't have an error on the on the function. yeah so let's let's try to create one let's call this uh in a just force it to be unhappy and try running that debug again no, that didn't work either uh what about uh s just change the service I'm trying to force the system to be unhappy no, it doesn't work save the file maybe i don't okay there we go oh there we go that definitely did something there. So, team, what Lucas? My, my point I was trying to make is that I, I feel like this gives me more power to like yeah control stuff. The markers is is great, but it gets really clouded with information. If yeah, you have yeah. A lot of that's right. Here. That that's what I've seen, and I didn't understand the way it it does browse uh, two, three, four, and then um, I don't know. It's what are these numbers? The many so what, times you run the, the function? No, I believe what we're seeing here, Frederica, is the code or the, the developer that wrote this function, uh, search tweets. This is the function itself. So this is the underlying instruction that the interpreter is doing. When I call the search tweets function, this is the code that's running in the background. Ah, uh, that's great. So I can see what how the function yeah. is. As, but at the bottom here, uh, oh. in the console, there is the browser too, that, and the like, like the debug things, and the, I don't know what. Well, so, I'm, so the the way how the debugger works is just pretty much similar to other programming language, where you can step through the code line by line to find yeah. where it fails. Uh, it's probably beyond what we're talking about right now, but the the point I was trying to make is that it's uh, for the purposes of trying to um, finding errors in in the code somewhere. The debugger gives you more power. Um, than That's the market. amazing. The market just give you the information that hey, there's an error somewhere here, but uh, if you really want to fix it, like where exactly it happens, you can you can go through the uh, the debug. That's really awesome. I didn't realize that this was an option or, or, or again, one more layer of, of learning uh, in our studio that I wasn't aware of. This is really cool. I can see where this would definitely help you if you're writing your own program or your own uh, package uh, and, and debugging exactly what the, what the underlying code is doing. This would yeah. be a, a really great way of, of cat, uh, catching or, or <laughs> viewing problematic uh, issues that that may be others may be receiving as well. Yeah. Well, the markers and the debugger kind of can run hand in hand. Yeah. Like if okay. the, if you see in the markers that it tells you there's an X, then you go, oh, well, these are simple errors. But it, sometimes if the markers tell you there's an X, then you know, oh, I should go to that line of code to check yeah. what the error is causing. So that's how those two can be used together. Like this cool. markers aren't used to fix your problems. Markers yeah. are used to know that there is a problem that needs to be fixed. And then the you highlight. can use the debugger to um, try to fix the problem. Very cool, very cool. It's pretty cool. No, this is awesome. Uh, uh, team, we're, we're, we're at the top of our hour of, of time. Uh, next week, I believe we're going to be discussing chapter seven, and I don't know what chapter seven is about. Uh, I don't know if there's a volunteer or, or John hasn't mentioned anything yet. Um, what I wanted to do is open the 
give you the title of what chapter seven is about. It looks like exploratory data, uh, data analysis. Um, I don't know if anybody is scheduled to present. Uh, if nobody has decided, I'm assuming John may. Um, I want, I'm doing my best to try and stay about four chapters ahead if I'm going to volunteer for a presentation. Uh, I'm not as familiar as, as others may be in, in presenting. So the, uh, I will do my best to get this video uploaded as quickly as possible to our Slack channel and uh, show that I, I, I can actually hopefully be a moderator uh, helping at anybody else in the, uh, the use of, of this service. So do we have any questions that haven't been answered? I now figured out how I can add my chat window. Uh, Lucas added the rocker project. Uh, Ryan had made a comment about the assignment. And okay, looks like everyone else is signing out as well. So uh, team, I appreciate everyone's uh, uh, patience and, and uh, focus today. Uh, I look forward to next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Bye. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ryan. You bet.